Hello. Today's keynote speaker is Dr. Karen Cangelosi. She is the program director for RLOE, the Regional Leaders of Global Education Network. Currently works for OE Global. As a dedicated faculty member in biology and student advocate for many years, she's found her way to open education, which she has seen especially powerful for helping to bring about as much needed large scale change in higher education. Dr. Cangelosi is a national leader in open education, STEM education, faculty development, innovative and, and, and digital pedagogies, and authentic student-centered learning. At Keene State College, Dr. Cangelosi has served as open education faculty fellow for many years, where she spearheaded a movement uh, at the college to replace traditional textbooks with OER and other freely available resources for nearly all biology courses, uh, in the KSC Biology, BS, and BA degree programs, saving their students thousands of dollars. She is also a street activist who for many years has marched, chanted, and organized around diversity, anti-racism, social justice, <coughs> equity, <coughs> excuse me, inclusion, and have been a leader in the organizations working especially for women and LGBT rights. And if you want to know about the evolution of social behavior and the ways in which multiple factors influence foraging complexity in a web invading, sometimes kleptoparasitic spider, just ask our keynote speaker. Well, folks, we virtually flew her in from cool, crisp Massachusetts. So please put your hands together and give a warm, open Texas 22 welcome to Dr. Karen Canzalosi. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Jim. Um, I wasn't expecting the reference to me being an arachnologist and, and talking about spiders, which of course I love. I'm happy to answer spider questions, but hopefully we'll talk about other things today. Um, I'm really super happy to be here and I'm just very appreciative of um, all of you and the committee that has um, put this whole shindig together here. <laughs> and. Um, I just I want to begin with a land acknowledgement and acknowledging uh, that land acknowledgements are not always <laughs> what we want them to be. Um, but I want to begin by acknowledging the land that we are each on, the land to which we belong and the original harm we all experience inverting belonging. Instead of recognizing that we belong to the earth, the land, the water and the sky, we assume the earth and the beings that comprise it can belong to any of us. So let's acknowledge the original inhabitants, our arboreal and botanical kin, the other animals and the first human inhabitants of the land in the geographic region in which you live, where I live and work that is on the unceded homelands of the Pocomtuck Nation on the land of the Nonotuck community known as Western Massachusetts these days in the United States. And let us remember too that we're part of the web of life that extends back to a time when our ancestors were indigenous to the land they first inhabited. And, and as I mentioned, land acknowledgements can be hollow if they aren't associated with action steps for supporting indigenous communities. And um, as, as Jeff and Roberts mentioned, you know, for those of us in colleges and universities, doing some research uh, about the Morrell Act of 1862, which gave close to 11 million acres of indigenous land to 52 land grant universities is a start. And considering how these land grabs benefited university systems is a first step towards acknowledging the colonial history upon which academia is generally based and the colonization, which it continues to uphold in a myriad of ways. And perhaps keeping this in mind, this context, it might help us untangle the difficult pathways that we need to take to undo harmful structures in higher education, which is which is what I want to talk about today. And I'm, I'm going to ask um, uh, Jim or Leah, one of the folks here, to put the link in the chat in order to do a little bit of research about land grab universities and the Morrill Act. Uh, this is a really good website and a place to start. I know that many of you may have other um, uh, resources that are even better that you know, and I invite you to share those as, as well. Um, it's it's really, um, it, like I had said in Twitter this morning, it's a tough act to follow <laughs> Jasmine Roberts, and I'm going to um, mention her a few times uh, this morning. And, and like Jasmine, who quotes Mahabali, I want to also acknowledge that any keynote is drawn on the ideas of 
many others, not just one person. I'm deeply appreciative to all of my colleagues and tweeps in open ed, critical dish pad, STEM ed, and social justice, uh, many of whom I, I cite in this talk here. Um, so I want to start with this question, like, um, what is our work in open, right? The theme of the conference, the labor of open education. We talked a lot about labor yesterday and throughout this conference, like what does it mean to do work in open? And I actually, I think about this question all the time, especially when people ask me, um, just what is it that you do do now? You know, now that you're not teaching about spiders or marine biology so much anymore, what 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 the heck do you do? Like, what is open education? And it's not an easy question to answer in three minutes or less when you're at dinner with somebody. Um, and I like make many of you. I usually start with talking about OER and its many promises, its free resources, and access to education, and the potential of five R's to transform learning. Uh, but when we talk about the labor of open ed and questions about sustainability arise, like who's going to do all of this work? You know, what is it that we're doing, right? That, that, like, how do we keep making enough OER? And, and I think the question really becomes just what is it that we're working towards? Right? What, what is it that we're trying to sustain? Is it a continued production of more and more OER resources? that will mimic what commercial publishing companies produce now? Is that our goal? Uh, calls for OER to be the same as traditional texts, calls for OER support materials and PowerPoints and test banks and lab manuals and everything I had from a publisher before, but now I want it in OER form. Is that, is that, what, we're, is that what we're doing? Yes, we can save students a ton of money, which is a great thing, but what have we really transformed about our educational systems? Right? And, and why does the open ed movement, at least to me, it seems to be stalling a little bit. So when, when we examine the data, when we think about the whole OER life cycle, and, and many investigators have looked at this life cycle, and I'm presenting to you here some data that's based on a survey of about 3,200 faculty, um, where they looked at, first of all, just awareness, like in 2020, about 58% of these faculty were even aware of OER, and it actually ticked up a little bit during the pandemic, but that didn't lead to increased adoptions. So we're still looking about at about only 15% of people uh, using OER at all. And then when you start thinking about adapting and using and refining and remixing and revising, uh, the authors of this study say it was so low that they couldn't even measure it, you know, which is why I put it down at less than 1%, but it's actually was like so, just not even measurable. That's how little it was. Um, and so when we look back, like this quote was from 2014 by James and Basu. And they said, despite the rhetoric, the reality is that OER uptake and reuse in formal educational context appears minimal. And that was in 2014. And, and it seems to still be true in, in 2022. And so, um, so when we think about like, why? Right, all, all of the things that we've been talking about, why OER creation and adoption and revising and remixing remain low, the, these questions about labor are, are definitely at the top of our list, right? Awareness is increasing slowly, partly because people still perceive the quality of the resources to not be good enough. Um, the lack of institutional incentives and faculty motivation, right? Unrewarded labor. Right, recognition and money. <laughs> Again, a big, a big theme here. The lack of technological infrastructure, accessibility features, findability. Um, and this is a this is a big one here, like revise and remixing often isn't considered original or scholarly enough. It's not rewarded in uh, evaluation systems like promotion and tenure or, or more generally. And I was thinking about what Jasmine was talking about yesterday which is that adjunct faculty and other non-tenure non track and part-time faculty, they seem to do the majority of the labor in open ed, right? And so the marginalization of the resources are being perceived as low quality, right? Gets reflected by the marginalization of the faculty and staff that are trying to work and create those resources, right? It's, it's like really a, a, a terrible a cycle, right? So, so how do we begin to address all this? 
in, in 2018, Rajiv Janjiani and Amanda Coolidge wrote this excellent article about the need for collaboration in order to have a sustainable open education movement. And it's, it's a great article where they're talking about why people are still picking commercial textbooks. But in particular, they emphasize that unsupportive colleagues can pose a significant challenge to the adoption of OER. Okay, but why many colleagues or professionals are unsupportive or uncooperative in the first place, I think is what we really need to, to drill deeper into. Uh, because the challenges for open are integral to our higher education systems and structures, not individuals, they can't be addressed solely by professional development efforts. You know, I wanna say that again, Systemic issues can't be addressed solely by professional development efforts. I find this analogous to thinking that we can shop or recycle our way out of the environmental crisis. Yes, it helps to buy less plastic and recycle what you use, but ultimately our structures that produce all of that plastic and give consumers very few affordable alternative options are what need to change. <clears throat> The individual academic superstar is still the holy grail because this is what our systems reward. It's not just about a bunch of bad apples at your school. We don't really value cooperative group effort when it comes to things like promotion and tenure or in faculty and staff evaluation procedures more generally or other rewards and recognition and fa that faculty and staff get. We can't think of this as a problem of isolated individuals when competition, not cooperation, is what we actually promote in our institutions in spite of the rhetoric around collaboration. So, and even in collaborative projects, individual efforts are often parsed out. So we're sure we know exactly who did what. And by the way, this spills into our obsession with grading individual effort in student team projects. Like I can't have my students work as a group. I won't know how to grade each one. Like we're, we're just obsessed with this idea. <clears throat> and so, our educational structures like promotion and tenure, faculty evaluation and grading. So I'm talking about both faculty and staff and students, right? We need to build in more intentional ways to value cooperation, community, collaboration and societal benefits over individual achievement. I think that one of the, one of the ways that we can start to think systemically is to confront the idea that a textbook equals the teacher or course. You know, it was commercial textbook companies that originally sold this idea anyway, right? And now we have fancier sets of packaged materials and books and learning exercises and test banks that, that teaching is just delivering a package of stuff. And so even if we're creating OER, do we just want our teaching to be about delivering content? Um, I, want to, I want to read this quote or a quote from this introduction to the two books, Designing for Care and Toward a Critical Instructional Design. If you haven't got a hold of these two books, you should definitely do it now. There are, there are open access and also options for purchase. Um, and the introduction is by Martha Burtis and Jared Quinn. And they're, they're, the authors are talking about online teaching. Um, but basically, they're confronting this idea that teaching is just delivering stuff, whether it's digital or not. And what they say is, what if technology has so far interpreted instruction for us, even from the days of correspondence courses, making the page, digital or otherwise, a surrogate for our pedagogies? How do we reclaim the relational, communal, intimate side of teaching when glass and pixels and apps stand between? We must shift our focus from the screen to the student, from best practices to humanizing pedagogies. Uh, and so this, this idea of like switching a focus from OER to open pedagogy, it, it's not new, right? I, but I do think that this focus on resources, it, it not only dehumanizes our teaching, it leaves us continuously vulnerable to predatory publishing companies that we're likely not going to be able to keep competing with, right? And so when we bring our pedagogies and our practices and our philosophy and our engagement with students to center stage, this is what they can't easily commodify. I think the widespread failure of forced large scale online content delivery teaching during the pandemic shed an extremely bright light on this reality. 
right? We actually need human teachers that care about students. Who knew? And I really appreciate the discussion that we were having yesterday about how if our teaching is primarily done by people in precarious positions who don't have time or money to do it, then there may not be a choice to just use the, then other just using materials delivered by companies. I get that. Again, it's a systemic problem, not the problem of individuals who have little choice about these companies' products. And again, professional development isn't the answer. They know, right? <laughs> we know. It's just that we need systems in, in place to support people. I'm also not saying that we shouldn't teach online at all. I, I'm just saying there's much better ways to do it. And I'm not saying that we don't need textbooks at all uh, or discounting the benefits of OER. And the fact that um, OER economic benefits have been extraordinarily helpful to millions of students across the globe and access to these materials has been crucial as many have written and spoken about. And, and furthermore, OER has given us opportunities to transform our learning materials to be more culturally relevant, anti-racist and equity focused. And these three projects highlight some amazing work that's being done. Uh, the Rotel project, which is um, uh, looking at uh, transforming open textbooks to be more culturally relevant, a, a, a group of um, six public uh, institutions in Massachusetts that got a grant to do this work. The Doers Project and their Equity Through OER rubric, you've probably seen them uh, posting about uh, grants that you can get for your institution of about $10,000 to use this rubric it, while putting OER together to really make sure that it's aligning with these uh, dimensions of equity. And the Academic Senate for the California Community Colleges, uh, their idea framework, again, trying to make OER more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and anti-racist, and a, a framework to help guide people to do that. And so, um, and there, there are probably many other projects that I'm not aware of. I'm just highlighting some of the ones that I'm uh, more aware of. And, and I think that uh, these are great projects and that transforming OER is a really important goal. Um, but I also think it's time for true revolution and transformation in higher education. And that open education can actually be a much more powerful key to making those changes. Right. And so as OER sort of continues to make baby steps towards equity, you know, we should be asking, can open pedagogy be more of a pathway towards liberation, you know, towards the real changes for higher education that we need in order to address critical problems that our planet is facing? Um, and we need to ask critically, can it be? because not all open pedagogy or open practices are created equal. And as Mahabali would probably say, not everybody wants to watch the ball game. <laughs> so, um, so what does it mean? So what do we mean, right? So, and again, as I mentioned before, many others have called for more of a focus on open pedagogy over OER, but I wanna take a few minutes to talk about exactly what open pedagogy or open practices mean for me and, and invite you to, to reflect on what they mean for you or what they could mean for you, because I, I just want us to, to think about it. Do we want open pedagogy assignments that basically resemble traditional assignments with, with an open license attached? Or, or can there be more to all of this? Okay, Is, is the work that we do in open just an add-on? Right? And this was, this was part of the Twitter discussion, is it, and that Jasmine brought up, is it just that, well, let's just do this on top of this so-called important uh, sort of colonial work that we do in academia, right? So this is what I really want us to confront. Um, and before I actually get into describing what open pedagogy means for me, I, I want to emphasize our current context for education. Just what is this backdrop that we're working in, okay? And, and you're all familiar with this, right? Uh, declining enrollments is a, a, a really big um, thing that it, it, that we hear all about, you know, there's increased competition amongst institutions because enrollments are declining and we don't have enough students and there's a financial precarity, um, especially in online spaces, but even generally concerns that students um, are cheating, there's concerns about academic integrity, and all of these fears uh, within our institutions kind of accelerated by the pandemic, but definitely predate the pandemic, um, have just 
led these poor these for profit ed tech companies to capitalize on these fears and allowing them and these companies to control online course delivery pedagogy and even entire degree programs in some case and Jesse Stommel and Martha Burtis talk about this in their piece called counter friction to stop the machine okay and so um again when we're when we're thinking about this is the context that we're working in you know, how do we get here? And, and why is it that these companies uh, seem to be winning winning the race? And, and these discussions are not new. This is not since the pandemic. This is not since people decided maybe we need more online teaching. This has been around for a long time. And um, John Warner, who um, and, uh, has been talking and writing about problematic and systematic, systemic issues in education, you know, in his book here, John Warner argues that the reason students can't write or more generally aren't learning as well as we think they should is due to decades of educational reform in both K through 12 through higher ed that's created this atmosphere. And, and, and again, I would argue it dates way back before these day, decades, all the way to our uh, colonial history and how we think about academia. Um, but we have in higher ed and in K through 12, actually, an atmosphere that places greater value on achievement than on learning, standardized tests and assessments that suck the life out of learning, and actually incentivize cheating, right? We tell students that the only thing of value is their grade. The only thing, the only way they're going to get ahead is to be better than everybody else. The only, the only thing you're going to be able to do to be successful in life is to do well on these tests and um, just freak our students out so much, make some of them so desperate that, that they do cheat. And we're, and we're wondering why they're trying to cheat their way through a system that they feel is impossible to get through. Um, and, and the same thing about grades, right? We, we tell students that the grades are the only currency of value in academia, and then we turn around and call students grade grubbers when they're fighting for every last point. Right? So, and, and then we also have surveillance systems that are tracking and monitoring and punishing and insisting on compliance. Like, the, is this the atmosphere that we want for education? You know, can we be change agents that turns this around and and a lot of times i hear people say well that's how it is you know this is what the accreditation boards you know we make accreditation boards actually they weren't handed down from god like we make all of these structures that we have we make them and i'm not saying that some of us don't have a whole hell of a lot more power than others to make changes here but i think collectively we can be doing a lot more to make a difference and and where i want to start with talking about open and getting back to my definition of open pedagogy which is what i said i was going to talk about more is to start talking about trust power and agency and all of the ways that students can be provided with agency by teachers, but that we be able, but we need to be able to do, do this with support of our systems. Because again, I recognize that everything that I'm going to say here is labor too, and also it's it's not always within the control of individuals. Again, we're talking systemically, um, but students can, you know, if we allow them to, if we empower them to, they can create that content, right? They can write the syllabus, <laughs> they can write attendance policies for your course. They can create the learning outcomes. They can determine what goes on during the class. They can design assignments. So it's not just you designing all the assignments. <clears throat> they can decide what work they want to make public or openly licensed or not, right? Because students being forced to put an open license on their work is not open pedagogy, that's exploitation. Right. So letting students have choice and freedom and flexibility and, and they can be they can determine how they will be graded or if they should be graded. And our systems should really be thinking more about this, because I think this really relates to what I'm talking about in how we build in competition over collaboration within our systems. Grading is not just about individual courses and individual students. It's about the very fabric of our society. And so the students can do stuff, but they need stuff, right? They need to have a connection that they feel to the course, to the teacher, to their peers, 
both with, within and beyond the course. There, there has to be something better than I just showing up to get through this. You know, I've had students say things like, I just can't wait to forget everything I learned on that organic chemistry test because now I can just get through and move on and I got my grade. Like there has to be a whole lot more than this <clears throat> because what are we doing? Students need flexibility by default, not as an exception. Okay, I guess I'll give you 10 extra days. Like making deadlines, making fl flexibility in all of the ways in which they can contribute. And they need basic needs. They need food and shelter and housing and all, all of the things that support just the livelihood of humans. And so when I think about uh, the transformative potential of open education, we also have to think about how it's really transformative. And, and I want to talk about this article by Maha Bali, Catherine Cronin, and Rajiv Janjiani, Framing Open Educational Practices from a Social Justice Perspective, which maybe many of you have read. But, but the, the, the line here that I wrote, like open educational practices can be transformative if, right? Those are caveats. And only if marginalized students have power of decision making over content, process, and epistemological frameworks, right? And only if they actually challenge power in the classroom, not just between teacher and students, but also among students of different backgrounds, because not all students are the same either, right? Such that students of marginalized backgrounds are able to make decisions and modifications. This can be the powerful, transformative potential of open education. And we need to think about how to do this. Raywin Connell, when she writes about decolonizing the curriculum, and she wasn't writing particularly about open education. Uh, she's writing about curriculum reform. And she says curriculum reform, if it's not to be the imposition of an orthodoxy, as authoritarian regimes try to do, requires us to think hard about the relationship between democracy and education. In an education oriented to democracy, all learners are advantaged, not disadvantaged, by others' success in learning. And I highlighted that because the idea that if I get a better grade, it means that you have to get a lower grade. And, and, and she's confronting that, that actually, if everybody does well, we're all doing well, right? And that, that's only likely to happen through curriculum that emphasizes shared knowledges and cooperative learning. And again, she wasn't talking about open ed uh, because again, none of the ideas in open education are actually new, right? We're, we're just compiling them. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Okay. And so when, when I think about um, cooperative learning, right? How is it that we can encourage this true non-competitive cooperation that isn't just a nice idea, but I think absolutely crucial to access the combined cognitive and compassionate processes that are required to address the difficult problems that humans face in every corner of the world. Because let's face it, that is our job in higher education to, to address the, the problems on this planet. And we're running out of time, right? Can we build classrooms that are based on this? Um, and this next slide is a quote from a student in an open pedagogy class, I think it just gives a little inkling of this idea um, where he wrote, this method of learning, although unconventional, allowed everyone within the class to create really good relationships. I think part of this stems from the fact that there's no underlying competition to be the best in the class or the smartest. I feel like this is something that could help me in the future. Like this last part, I feel like this is something that could help me in the future, having myself and my peers remember the good relationships formed within these classes, right? And, and I'd like to optimistically think and replicate them and go out there to be the citizens of the world and the leaders of companies and like keeping that in mind because that is actually what we're, what we're teaching our students uh, and, and getting them to be inspired to be. Um, and so I want to talk about open pedagogy, and I want to um, I want to say that Jasmine Roberts reminded us yesterday that these ideas aren't new, 
right? And I'm not claiming that I came up with them all myself. Absolutely not. All of the, all of the people that I'm citing, and they're, and they're strongly rooted in Black feminist liberation. Many of these ideas come from Bell Hooks and others. And if you haven't read Bell Hooks' Teaching to Transgress, then just turn this keynote off now and go read it right now. <laughs> so I'm merely suggesting a way that I think is useful for organizing our thoughts around these ideas and leveraging the power of the open license in much more powerful ways. And so I have four circles here. I, I think the first one about collaborating, connecting and creating community absolutely has to be key for open pedagogy. And obviously, um, inclusively creating and sharing knowledge, you know, creating knowledge that others can use and sharing it and using an open license so that others can access it and read it and refine it and share it and use it too, right? Not just dispose of it. <clears throat> and students having agency, especially marginalized students, having agency in learning design, policies, content, you know, being a key part of open practices. And that the idea that access to food, housing, gas, laptops, captions, safety, learning materials, et cetera, you could add to this list, is a critical part of open pedagogy. It's not just an add-on. None of this is, oh, that would be nice if we had this piece. But for me, in order for it to be open pedagogy, it needs to kind of encompass all of this. And in order for it to actually do some important work in the world. <clears throat> and so... When, when I think about the trust, the agency, the empowerment, the cooperative learning that we can bring to our, to our learning spaces, where faculty and staff can address student anxiety, isolation, powerlessness, and marginalization in, in all the ways that we are able to, that we're actually leveraging open to transform the educational environment, which cultivates opportunities for creativity and contribution. Right. And then students can actually, when they're in that environment, they can address political injustices and share knowledge. They can address the very systemic problems that we're trying to solve economically, environmentally, socially, culturally, and even in our educational systems themselves. You know, when, when we talk about change, we're talking about the fact that um, cultural change doesn't happen overnight right? Change is a process, not an event. And so the more in which we do this, the more in which we produce students that can do this, the more in which we may see shifts in the very context in which we work over time. <clears throat> and so I, I, I want to present a few sort of just examples. They're not meant to be like the best thing that you could ever do in the world. They're not meant to be the only kinds of things you can do. I bet many of you on this chat um, are doing similar things and I, I hope that you share them. I'd love to see links and shared ideas in the chat for open pedagogy, but I like to think of open pedagogy as public service. And here's an example of uh, Carlos Gallier's metagenomics class where he has students producing podcasts that anybody in the world can listen to and they have an open license on them. And this example of antimicrobial resistance in the environment being shared with others. This student is both learning about microbiology and serving uh, uh, the public. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Fellowship from Montgomery College um, also at Quantlin Polytech, and I'm surprised not all over the U.S. because this is just a brilliant idea. Like, why not take the ideas from the from these UN goals and create projects that actually benefit the public and get them out there more widespread? Blankets for babies, you know, dentists providing free dental care for people across the world, marine waste solutions. You can go on and on about what students can do. And again, I'm think, I, I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about, oh, this would be a nice little project to add on to your class. I'm talking about making it the course. And it doesn't have to be an environmental studies course. It could be any kind of a course that you can make this stuff the course. <clears throat> when we talk about students that have the ability to speak in their own voice, like the self-determination of marginalized groups to speak for themselves, uh, and this is an example of a student from Thailand who's taking what she learned about the genetics of skin color and thinking about her family 
and writing about the social construction of race and not just writing about it because she chose to and she and she chose to think about this and put it in whatever context she wanted to but sharing it with others because she chose to right she wanted other students and people to know what she thought about this and to have it out there and this is what contributing to a knowledge commons and addressing political justice can look like in, in open pedagogy and, and in the creation of oer having students create oer um, there are so many times people say, but there's no OER for that. I don't have this in my field. And I'm like, well, make it with your students, not just, oh, go out and make it yourself, because that's a lot of work, right? That's labor. That's a lot of trouble. And getting students to do it, actually, students can do so much more than we think they can do. Uh, these students actually envisioned, thought of the idea, created the chapters, wrote everything, edited it. Um, rewrote pieces across uh, three years and two different semesters and a summer, including alumni, put this book together. Um, and it was completely student driven and, and certainly professor guided and giving help and reflection, but coming from the students in terms of what they really wanted to be able to share with the world. <clears throat> Wikipedia. Again, you know, have your students improve Wikipedia's coverage of racial justice or, or any topic. This, this reaches audiences of millions. And I know many of you are familiar with this idea. But when I say leverage Wikipedia and make it your whole course and really get students inspired to, to do this kind of work, again, not just as an add on. Some of you might be familiar with the new open climate campaign that's come out as a partnership between Creative Commons, Spark, and Eiffel. And it's an amazing project, right? This is an amazing recognition that we need to use open science to solve problems. The number one thing facing our planet right now, which is climate change, um, to accelerate discovery, promote research collaboration, bring together the efforts of global stakeholders, right? Like the way open science accelerated vaccine development for COVID, okay? And yes, we need to make appeals to existing research organizations and senior scientists and the major climate laboratories across the globe. But if we don't change the educational system itself that we use to prepare our next generation of scientists, and teach them how to do science openly and how to leverage their cognitive diversity and how to be motivated and inspired to contribute knowledge for the sake of society, not for individual superstar status, then addressing climate change and social issues more generally will continue to be the uphill battle that we're losing, right? And so the open pedagogy of open science like, why aren't all science classes like this, teaching students the values and practices and challenges of opening up scientific work? And, and by the way, most of the challenges are because people are worried about losing their status and gains. And rightfully, they are because they're in a context of competition. And I'm, again, I'm not saying there are simple answers. I don't have the answers. I hope that we collectively can come up with answers. There's a wonderful quote from Catherine D'Ignacio and Lauren Klein in their book uh, from Data, uh, Data Feminism and Teach Data Like an Intersexual Feminist, where they say, what if we imagine teaching data as a place to start creating the connected, collective, caring world that we want to see? So just substitute the word data for any subject, you know, and, and that can be the purpose of our teaching, the purpose of our institutions, the role of higher education, like really taking higher education into a place of real transformation and getting students to go out there and collect data and ask their own questions. And, and they, they, these authors had students asking questions like, is the lottery good or bad for your neighborhood? Let's collect some data on that. Let's drill down on that. There's just, there's so much possibility and there's so much open data for any field. Uh, it can be art, you know, there's data on public art installations in cities around the world. There's so much that you can do in any field. So, uh, you know, I, I think that open education uh, can be a really powerful level in a sustainable global open education movement. And, and I hope that you're with me. I hope that you agree with me. I'd, I'd like to see uh, folks uh, feeling like this is what we are about here in in higher education and so i want to think about like 
you know, what, what is the work of open? The question that I began with, right? What is the work of open? And, I, and, I, and I'm going to try to leave enough time for us to have a little chat and, and hope that people have ideas. Um, but for me, when I, when I come back to this question, and these are just some of my answers, I want to know what your answers are. I want you to put what is the work of open education uh, in the chat as I offer some of my own ideas here. To provide a nurturing place for students so they can focus their creative energy on learning and problem solving, right? Not worrying where their next meal is coming from or competing with their peers or focusing on achievement and credentials and status and income. This is the work of open. To help students to discover and create and share and learn in order to improve the world in which we all live. This is the work of open to design and build more intentional structures for valuing cooperation, community, collaboration, and societal benefits over individual achievement. This is the work of open. To use open practices and pedagogies to transform our systems of higher education, to work in service for the people of our nations, to address the intractable problems our planet faces. For me, this is the work of open. Higher education is under siege right now. I don't think that's an overstatement. The pandemic and shifting demographics do not fully explain all of the enrollment decline and enrollment declines do not fully explain the devastation of many of our academic institutions due to financial exigency, quote unquote. We need to take a good long direct look at the anti-academic sentiment in this country, leading to lower and lower public support and a public all too willing to adopt an anti-fact, anti-science, anti-education stance, right? a stance suggesting that there is a really low value to a college education. And so I, I feel like, you know, this quote from Henry Giroux really captures it. Education is vital to the creation of individuals capable of becoming critical social agents, willing to struggle against injustices and develop the institutions that are crucial to the functioning of a substantive democracy. Right, we're, we're talking about our very democracy right now. And this is what is our important work in the world as higher educators. And so debunking the dangerous disinformation plague that's threatening our democracy, this too is the work of open. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end to give us some time for questions and I'm just gonna end with another Henry Giroux quote. And um, I am happy to, to field uh, any questions that you all might have. I'm gonna stop the screen share here. Hey, Jim. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we'll now move into the Q&A portion of today's session. Uh, a reminder to our attendees that we are still recording. Uh, use the Q&A tool to send your questions and uh, you may also ask questions anonymously there. Okay, first question. Uh, can you provide an example of, of, of providing for basic needs as part of your approach to open uh, pedagogy? An example of how to provide basic needs? Yes. Okay, um, yeah, I, I think that um, th this is again, not something that an individual does. It's something that institutions work together to do. A lot of colleges and universities have food pantries, um, but I feel like if you're thinking about what you can do within your own context. And I'm not exactly sure um, where, the, um, where the writer of the question is coming from in their context, but just asking a student, like, are, do you have everything that you need in your life? Are you okay? You know, do you, are, are you falling asleep in my class because you, you're working two jobs? You know, are, are you low on cash? And and there are ways that you can individually provide support for students and send them to places at your colleges and universities to get that kind of support. Um, and so there are things that we need to do both institutionally, but that we can also do individually in our interactions with students. I, I hope that 
um, is addressing the question. I'm happy to, to take a follow up if it's not. Okay, next question. How do you prevent students from becoming overwhelmed at the level of choice that you suggest giving them in instructional design? Yeah, you know, somebody asked me this question yesterday uh, in a different context where they're like, you know, students aren't used to this. You know, they're going to be overwhelmed. They're, they're you know, the, 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 the idea is that, of course, they've been trained through all of their K through 12 system in higher ed to be uh, to receive education a certain way. Like this is a system, this is now how, this is how I know how to do it. And, and even some of the, the smarter students, the straight A students struggle the most because they're like, I know how to be successful there. What are you asking me to do? Um, I think that you, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be um, all or nothing. You don't have to say, okay, I'm just gonna give you everything and I'm gonna walk away, right? Like there's, there's ways in which you can scaffold it. There are ways in which you can provide examples uh, there's ways in which you can get the student peers to give examples. Um, it, it really helps when you have other colleagues that are doing similar things and students are experiencing this in their other courses, right? That's like as these changes come about more slowly. When there were three or four of us doing open pedagogy in biology at Keene State, the students would come into my class from somebody else's class and saying, oh, I know this drill. Okay, so I'm not so overwhelmed because I know what you're talking about. And I'm not so overwhelmed because I'm not worried about my grade, right? Like, so that becomes part of it too. And I know that not everybody is in a place to say, oh, I'm just gonna take grades away or I'm gonna make grading alternative. You might be able to make more alternative grading changes, even though we give a grade at the end of the semester, there are ways to make students have more agency in how their grade's gonna be determined so they're less overwhelmed. And, and the more that we can communicate to them, this is opportunity, not a hoop you have to jump through. This is your chance to contribute. This is where I want you to work with your peers and have your ideas flourish and be able to contribute and to have them say, I wanna to come to this class. I wanna work with my peers. I wanna do this cool thing. And can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? So they're less likely to be overwhelmed if they're not thinking in a traditional way where they're super worried about completing the assignment and, and finishing it on time and getting a particular grade. I'm really suggesting that we turn our mindsets around 180 degrees about what the purpose of school is. And I know it's crazy. I know y'all, many of you probably think I'm just crazy. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, from, from the audience, quote, people got uh, big mad at me at Open Ed 2019 for suggesting open pedagogy could, could exploit student labor. So uh, I how can we avoid infighting uh, and keep moving forward together. Yeah, because open pedagogy could exploit student labor, right? It could if, if you if you do it in the way that it exploits students. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of like a silly thing to say. Don't exploit your students as an answer to that, right? So so what do you mean? Like, oh, let's let's put our students together and make them create OER, and then we're going to put it out there, like we have to make our educational experiences for students of value to them, you know? And my students like, if you don't wanna do it, don't do it. You know, I'll say that to my students, you don't wanna do it, don't do it. Um, I don't want a student to feel tricked or exploited into creating something. You know, it's more about like, do they see value in it? Can they contribute something? I, I think that um, the, the, the person that asked this question, like how can we avoid infighting yeah, yeah we, we, we should avoid infighting in the open ed community, just like we should avoid it anywhere. You know, a lot of that comes from our own competition with ourselves, like in any of our contexts. And, and I think that um, really trying to teach the power of actual collaboration and community and contribution and having students focus on learning and not all of those other things is a tremendous uphill battle. Um, and so, yeah, students can be exploited in traditional contexts and they can be exploited in open contexts. So we have to be really careful about how we communicate with our students, what our expectations for our students are and, and what we want them to do. So I feel like um, it's not just a, oh, it's open pedagogy, it's automatically gonna do A, B or C. And I, I, this platform is a little hard. Like if I know if, if we were in a room and the person asking the question was in front of me, I could say, 
does can you tell me more and we'd have more of a discussion so perhaps that person is still online and hasn't left already and and, and if they would like to ask a follow-up i would love that for sure and i am going to be at the two o'clock uh eastern one o'clock um central time uh session too so we can talk more there great okay uh, our institution is working on revamping our our faculty evaluation process I would like to include a section on honoring collaboration with colleagues inside and outside of our institution. I want to value the growth mindset. Any advice? Um, I don't know that you need my advice. I feel like you're on the right track there. <laughs> like you're talking about honoring collaboration and colleague with colleagues inside and outside. Um, the the growth mindset. Yeah, for sure. I you know, I think that. Um, a lot of times people are looking to others and experts for ideas when really they know already. Like, what does it mean to honor collaboration? You know, what does it mean like to, for the whole project to be considered in its value as opposed to each person's contribution to that value? You know, otherwise we can start making collaboration competitive. Well, he collaborated a lot more than she did. <laughs> You know, it's 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 just like it's so hard for us to think differently that what if school was a place where you came and you sat around and you talked about ideas and you created things and you went out and you transformed the, the world. Um, and so the fact that we're that we need to bean count and we have to count things for promotion and tenure, it, it makes it hard. You know, it makes it really hard to put square pegs in round holes like like. I alluded to in the beginning, our academic structures are based on a, a very colonized mindset and colonial framework. Academia itself is hierarchical. Everything we do within it is always going to uh, suffer from this. So in these in these in between times, when we're really working towards larger shifts in an academic environment, um, I feel like um, there's going to be growing pain. And, and we're going to have to try to do it the best we can. And, and including a section about honoring collaboration, it has to be more than lip service, right? So how do we say this person actually is just doing a lot of collaborative work? Um, you know, if, it, if it's working alongside all the individual superstar stuff, it's, it's going to be just less potent in the beginning. And I think that over time, maybe we will start to see things grow a little bit more. Okay, here's the question, and then I'll read the prompt. The prompt is here, and here's the question. Okay. Uh, how, how do we do this? Okay, now, here we go. This revolution in centering students through open pedagogy requires a corollary revolution in reorienting, supporting, and developing faculty and in, in instructors to center their students. This requires serious structure change for graduate education and the professorate. How do we do this? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It totally does. It's exactly what I was talking about is it requires structural change just in the ways that I was talking about. Um, we need structural change in the way that we teach science students to do up in science. We need serious change for graduate education for teachers to teach differently. Right. We need to, to prepare the professoriate differently. The, the, the revolution does require changes at all levels. And um, again, it's not going to be overnight. It's not going to be something that we just um, say um, we are going to just flip a switch. And now we have this revolutionary change. And so the more that we have people agreeing with these ideas, yeah, this is what we need to be doing. The more we just start with conversations, just gathering around the dinner table, talking about how do we do it here? How do we do it there? How do we shift graduate education? How do we change professional development for faculty? How do we change our p &T guidelines? How do we, and, and, and not just, how do we change them so they still fit into everything I know before, but how do we really structurally change? And some people have said to me, you know, we, we need to just knock the whole thing down and build up a whole new sort of open university from scratch. And maybe they're right. You know, maybe they're right. But but changes and and revolutionary changes, structural changes are slow and gradual. And I think that the, the, the more that people actually believe that the change needs to happen and, and it can be really difficult, you know, the more that we're likely to 
to start to see these sorts of shifts over time. And, and I think that I think that there can be um, those shifts for sure. Okay, we have a comment uh, from the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I have found incredible support and knowledge in, uh, in RLOE. If you feel alone or need additional support in your ORE journey, I cannot recommend it enough. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. RLO stands for the Regional Leaders of Open Education, uh, which is a network through uh, the, the CCC OER, which is housed under OE Global. And um, you can definitely go to the, the CCC OER website. I can find a, a link. Thank you, Tanya. Um, support and no knowledge about OER, knowledge about open. But really one of the things we do in Arlo is just talking about these ideas of how do we support people in the context in which they live, especially marginalized communities. How are we transforming marginalized voices and power? Because maybe what has to happen to transform our academic institutions is a lot of us need to shut up and take a back seat. <laughs> maybe, maybe even me, right? Like we need to say, let's pull the voices of other folks together to say, this is what has to happen. And, and one of the things we really try to do in Arlo is to give, is to authentically give voice to people that haven't normally been what you what we think of as a leader in open ed, or really redefining uh, leadership. And I'm gonna try to find the um, link for Arlo. Love to you. We're, we're, we're actually working on trying to get another a phase of our grant funded. And I'm putting the Arlo link in the chat that maybe that can get shared in the um, in the hub there. But uh, we are hopefully going to uh, get refunded and be able to run some more of our leadership program. Okay, yeah, that's that's. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. There you go. Okay, um, I wonder if we can employ an asset-based community development approach to employing student community labor in creating open ed and pedagogy. An, can you say that again, an asset-based? Yes, uh, uh, I wonder if we can employ an asset-based community development approach to employing student community labor in creating open ed and pedagogy. Yeah, and I, I think maybe what they're referring to is the idea that um, if, if community development and a community approach actually uh, gives back something to the people that are building that community, students, faculty, staff that were, were using the idea of community building itself as a way that we reward people so that we're perpetuating its construction. Uh, perhaps that, that that's what they're talking about. I wonder that too. I think that's a great idea. Let, let's talk more about that. Um, I know we're almost out of time um, and that um, we're going to have a chance at the, the reflection session, which is at one o'clock uh, central time uh, uh, to, to talk more. So maybe I didn't quite get the whole uh, nuance of that question. I'd love to talk more about it. Uh, uh, can you take one more question, Karen? Sure. Okay, here we go. And okay, here we go. Uh, I think open also can have the goal of dismantling the prestige economy that exists mostly in journal publishing, but also in instruction and textbook publishing, a less competitive and more collaborative system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much, the prestige economy, it drives everything, definitely in publishing. You know, the whole problem with people not wanting open access is because they're, they're worried about not getting all of the credit that they need to be able to get to be successful. And again, I'm not blaming those individuals. Like you're literally going to die as an academic if you don't build up your, you know, resume for promotion and tenure. And so dismantling the prestige economy is everything, right? And it, like, like this person says, in journal publishing, instruction, textbook publishing, everything you know, how we measure prestige, you know, what if we had a, um, instead of a prestige economy, we had a compassion economy. <laughs> like you're measured, your worth is measured by how much compassion you show towards others. And, and maybe that's a, a tricky one, but I, but I think that uh, uh, 
that that is that is what we're talking about where we're going to. Great. Well, thank you so much, Karen, and everyone who attended today's session. Uh, if we didn't have a chance to answer your questions, I hope you'll join uh, our keynote reflection session this afternoon at 1 p.m. Central. I hope everyone will take a few minutes to complete our post-conference survey. Uh, Jessica will share a link and chat for you, uh, and we'll send the survey in an email to everyone uh, who registered. Right. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and thanks to the committee for everything. And I'll see you all um, at 1 o'clock. Look forward to seeing you again in sessions later today. Thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Jim, great job. Thank you.